Um, does anybody know that Iceland had the worst financial crisis of uh, any country in the last 100 years, any developed country? A lot of people don't know much about it. I co-authored a book about it several years ago. I thought it was a really interesting topic because it's a tiny country that not too much people know about. Uh, and yet it had this very severe crisis with very drastic repercussions for the rest of the world and a couple of lessons that the rest of us can all take from it. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, the, the first thing I'll start with, the recession in Iceland was so severe that Iceland was the very first developed country in over 30 years to request IMF help. If you know anything about the IMF, you must think that it's pretty drastic if you're going to go to those guys for help. In fact, uh, do you know how Ronald Reagan used to have a saying? It was, the when you're having a problem, the very uh, last 10 words that you want to hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, when you're having a financial crisis, the very last 10 words that you want to hear are, I'm from the IMF and I'm here to help. The, uh, just to give you a little bit of background here on Iceland's boom, the country is really minuscule. It's not very big. It's only 320,000 people. Uh, the boom roughly lasted for the first part of the 2000s, so I proxy it from 2000, 2001 to 2008. Uh, real GDP growth per person or per capita, I proxy that as uh, real income growth, was more or less about 2% a year. Uh, the stock market is growing a little bit, but really nothing too drastic. Uh, it was it doubled in size as a portion of, of, uh, of GDP over the decade. Inflation was a little bit high over the period, 6.5% a year, but even that doesn't seem so out of line with some countries. And then you turn to the monetary figures and something really looks wrong. The base money supply, or M1 rather, so currency and uh, deposits in the banking system, grew by 34% a year for almost a whole decade. And the broader credit supply, measured by M3, is growing by 25% a year for an eight-year period. So when you look at all of these figures, everything looks more or less normal until you get to the money side of the economy and something looks drastically wrong. So when I'm looking at Iceland's boom and bust, it's these figures that I really want to look at, or the monetary figures rather, that I want to focus on. In looking for why Iceland has so much money supply growth, and in particular why the boom became so extreme, the first place that I went to look at was why was it that so many people borrowed money? And the real reason, at least in my eyes, what I want to focus the first part of this presentation on are all the artificial guarantees that were given to investments in order to induce people to make uh, investments, especially in financial assets. And in particular, I want to focus on two types of guarantees narrow ones, those that apply to just one specific type of financial asset, and then broad ones, those guarantees that were more applying to the whole economy uh, at the same time. So the very first guarantee that we might want to look at uh, might seem innocuous enough. It's Iceland's Housing Financing Fund, uh, the HFF. Everybody knows about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the States, right? And I'm sure every country or most countries have something similar, an agency, a governmental agency, which exists to guarantee uh, mortgage debt or to promote home ownership. Iceland has this as well as the HFF. Uh, it's a little bit more severe or a little bit more overreaching than it is in most other countries. Uh, the official goal is really to ensure housing safety and equality for everybody. If you know anything about Iceland, it really prides itself on being an egalitarian society. So everybody in this country really means everybody. While in America, we had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that existed solely to help uh, low-income individuals buy houses. Iceland had the more or less same agency, but they extended it to high-income individuals as well. So if you were wealthy, don't worry. You can still get some support in buying your house from this agency. Uh, originally, it existed with one purpose, to help consumers, rich and poor, have access to houses, to basic real estate. Um, fair enough. By 2004, 90% of all Icelandic homeowners had a, had a mortgage offered to them through HFF. And if you added up the total value of these mortgages, it was about 50% of the total uh, bond market of Iceland. So it's an absolutely massive presence. And it doesn't stop there. Although they start nicely enough by just offering loans to homeowners, consumers, by 2005, they start extending these to commercial interests as well. This is not something that's in the original mandate, but they're expanding their powers to offer cheap mortgages to other people in the economy. Now, because HFF is offering mortgages directly to consumers and, and businesses in Iceland, if you think about the, the banking industry in any country, a pretty significant portion of its profits come from 
consumer, and commercial loans, in particular mortgages, right? So they must be taking a huge business avenue away from the private banks. If you were a private bank in Iceland, what do you think you'd be in a position to do? You'd probably be getting a little bit upset with the fact that all of your profit opportunities are being taken away from you, so you've tried to fight back a little bit. Now, the HFF, it's a branch of the government. Its bonds are guaranteed by the government. So essentially, people are getting uh, mortgages at interest rates which are more or less comparable to what the Icelandic government can borrow at. It's, it's, I suppose you could say, the lowest interest rate you could possibly pay in the Icelandic economy at that time. Banks, there's no way that they can outcompete the HFF on interest rates alone, right? There's no price competition because they're up against the most secure, the lowest interest rate lender in the whole country. So what do the private banks try to compete on? They go on the qualitative margin instead of the price margin. So they look at, uh, they look at what types of loans can we issue? Originally, loans in Iceland were for fairly, um, were for, for fairly low amounts. Slowly over time, private banks started upping the maximum loan that you could possibly get in order to buy a house. A nice way to proxy this is loan to value ratios. That's the amount of loan you can get relative to the value of the house that you buy. Uh, for the first half of the 2000s until 2004, if you were an Icelandic homeowner, the most loan to value or the highest loan to value ratio you could get was about 60%. Meaning if you bought a house for 200,000 euros, let's say it in euros, you could really only get uh, a loan for 80, uh, sorry, uh, 120,000 euros. You have to pay 80,000 euros in cash. By 2005, Icelandic banks start competing by upping these loan to value ratios first to 85%, and then by 2007, they opted all the way to 100%. So if you were an Icelander going to get a, going to buy your new house, not only do you get a, uh, not only could you get a really cheap loan, you could have all of that home's value covered by, uh, the loan that your bank is giving you. Now banks are doing this again, remember, to compete against the HFF on a margin which is not the price, the, the price being the interest rate. Well, if you're the HFF, how do you think you respond to this? You have to compete back because now you're losing business to the private banking industry. So they compete back by dropping their interest rates and they're actually offering interest rates lower than what the Icelandic government is able to borrow money at. In other words, Icelanders are able to finance houses at an even cheaper rate than what the Icelandic government is able to do. So then what does the private banking industry do? Well, they fight back against this once more and uh, they've already upped the uh, loan to value ratios as high as they possibly can, but they start extending the maturities of mortgages that they can offer. So originally you could borrow money for 25 years in Iceland, no problem. Then it's 40 years. 40 years is about the maximum that they extend it to, which relative to other countries is quite long. I don't know how things work in Poland, but in North America, you don't get much of a mortgage beyond 30 years, for example. Well, what's the result of all of this lending? You get an extreme housing boom, of course. Everybody's buying houses and housing prices are spiraling out of control due to the cheap credit, which is primarily fostered through the guarantees that the HFF is giving to homeowners. What's another type of guarantee we've got in the economy? Most of us know how deposit insurance works. Deposit insurance is a a method that we use to deal with any uh, fractional reserve banking system that has the instability that depositors might request too much money at the same time and banks would go bankrupt. Deposit insurance has a big problem. Everybody's really aware, even economists, even regulators are aware of this problem. It creates moral hazard. If you know that you're not going to personally uh, lose money by putting your money in a bank, you don't really pay attention to how your bank is performing or behaving. So you don't look at financial prudence as a criteria when you're choosing your bank because you're secure knowing that deposit insurance is going to take care of it. Now, from agencies that offer deposit insurance, they have a little bit of a different point of view on this. They, of course, if they're going to offer this product and create some moral hazard, they also need to do something to regulate the banking system to make sure it doesn't go bankrupt, right? Governments have deep pockets, but they still don't like to pay out uh, billions of euros or billions of dollars when banks go bankrupt. So they regulate uh, they regulate the banking industry to try to make sure that they don't go under or they don't do anything too silly with their money. The two things that typically you see uh, deposit insurance plans do, the two criteria that they set, the one is that they'll give a maximum insurable value to your deposits. 
So in the States, uh, historically, it was $30,000 per account. Now it's $100,000 per account. If you have anything above that in your bank account, it's not insured if your bank goes under. I'm sure the same thing exists in Poland at some level. Uh, it used to in Europe and in other European countries, although it's slowly changing. Now the reason deposit insurance plans do this is because if you have money over this amount, you're at risk of losing it if that bank goes under, correct? So now all of a sudden you've got a vested interest in where you put your money. And you pay attention to try to watch which banks are safe, which ones are prudent, and which ones aren't, and you direct your capital accordingly. And in that way, you're actually helping the regulators by choosing which banks are safe and which ones are unsafe or poor. The other thing deposit insurance plans typically do is only insure domestic currency. Most places, uh, or many places I should say, refuse to insure foreign currency accounts. Not all, but many. And the reason they do this is because foreign currency accounts are typically held by subsidiaries of your banks which are in a foreign country and they're more difficult to monitor. And also they do this because if a foreign bank goes under or an account which is in a foreign currency goes under, then all of a sudden you're on the hook for potentially a lot of money, right? The deposit insurance can always come up with money in the domestic currency. They could, uh, as a drastic scenario that I don't recommend, they could go to the central bank and say, hey, can you, uh, can you print up some money and give it to me so that I can bail out all of these deposit holders? Again, I don't recommend that. But if it's in foreign currency, you don't really have that option, right? You're at the whims of the market. The Icelandic deposit insurance plan was drastically different. There was no legal maximum amount that it would insure. They had, their, they had themselves on the hook for uh, an unlimited amount of money. It extended in its, its insurance to foreign currency accounts, which is really different because now all of a sudden if you had a, a subsidiary of an Icelandic bank in a foreign country, let's say uh, the United Kingdom or Netherlands or even Poland, all those accounts are now supposed to be secured and insured by the domestic regulator, by the domestic insurance plan. Um, what else do we have for, for a type of guarantee in the economy that might be causing some troubles? How about the lender of last resort? This is a topic which comes up many times during the crisis. In America, we saw that uh, the Federal Reserve stepped in as a lender of last resort to bail out some institutions, but not all of them. In the United States, this role is taken on on an ad hoc basis. They pick and choose who they're actually going to bail out, but the federal government or the Federal Reserve are never legally obliged to bail out these countries, uh, these companies rather. In Iceland, as of 2001, the Central Bank of Iceland was actually legally obliged by its charter to act as an explicit lender of last resort. If a bank got into trouble and it needed a bailout, it had to be forthcoming under the new bank charter, which was, again, put in place in 2001. So all of a sudden, think about your role as a, as a banker. Now you've got the Central Bank, which is actually guaranteeing you by law that it must step in and bail you out if you ever run into trouble. Or you could even imagine how you would act if all of a sudden uh, the central bank said, uh, don't worry, if you run into financial difficulties and you're going to declare bankruptcy, we'll step in and we'll bail you out. Just go about your business as you normally would. And the final one that I want to talk about is the IMF. The IMF is really an institution which is searching for a purpose. If you know the history of it, it's really a relic of a bygone era that still exists in some form today, and it constantly changes its mandate a little bit in order to uh, retain some relevance or try to be prominent in the world. Uh, originally, it existed in a world of fixed exchange rates and capital controls to keep everything in line and to manage individual countries' uh, capital flows. And then since the mid-70s, we had flexible exchange rates, and the IMF didn't really have much of a job anymore. Right, that was the original mandate and it's gone. So it switched into damage control and it started changing its mandate to be bailing out and assisting crisis-stricken countries. And now this is what we best know it for, right? Entering Iceland, uh, entering Ireland, entering Greece, whatever have you. Now, along the way, and especially throughout the, the, uh, the mid and the late 1990s, the IMF increased its calls to step into crisis-stricken economies and start bailing them out. And you have a whole series of speeches by IMF officials saying, uh, our job is not just limited to uh, giving advice on economies when they seem to be getting out of hand or when we start to sense imbalances. Our role is really after a crisis began to step in and start bailing out those countries so that the crisis doesn't worsen and, and maybe uh, seep over into other economies. In fact, in 2004, the then deputy director of the IMF, Ann Kruger, she's not 
uh, there anymore. She's not in that role anymore, rather. She went up to the, uh, the Central Bank of Iceland and she gave a speech to them. And the speech was exactly to this extent that our role, the IMF's role in the world economy is we're going to look at countries before crisis breakout and we're going to try to give some advice, although normally the advice is not exactly the, the greatest as you could imagine. But more properly, after the fact, we're going to go into these countries and we're going to bail them out and extend them credit. Now, what do you think the result of such talk is? Countries increasingly think, and they keep looking at the actions of this, of this supranational organization and say, well, it seems everybody else is getting a bailout. Whenever, uh, whenever it hits the fan, this group seems to come in and take control and loan you some money and things to be, seem to be okay. So why are we going to be any different? And if you look at quotes of Icelandic officials in 2008 and 2009, and especially uh, people in the banking industry, they all fully expected that the IMF was going to step in instantaneously if anything ever went wrong. What do you think the result is of these four, um, these four types of guarantees? And as you can imagine, you've got a whole series of uh, risk reductions that people think somebody else has their back and people are taking on riskier behavior, people are borrowing more money, taking on more loans, making more investments. And what we see is an absolute explosion in the amount of debt that this little economy has. This is, uh, throughout the 2000s, this is the amount of foreign debt that these, that uh, Iceland has. This is both public and private, uh, so individuals plus the government added up. And we can see by the time the peak of the boom is happening in late 2007, 2008, we've got over three times the size of the economy in foreign debt. And this isn't even counting the domestic debt, right? This is only the debt which is international or owed to foreigners. So we've got a really serious situation developing in Iceland where everybody's existing off borrowed money uh, and they're borrowing all this money because they think everybody's going to secure them somehow. Homeowners think that the HFF has their back. Uh, the banking system thinks that the Central Bank of Iceland and deposit insurance has their back. And the government thinks that the IMF is going to support them if anything ever should go wrong. Now, this debt buildup could only really happen if somebody was increasing the money supply somehow, right? This is, this is money which was loaned to somebody at some time, so this money actually has to come from somebody. So we need to start pointing the finger to see where this money is actually coming from. And really, there's two big avenues you can look at. There's the central bank creating money, right? Central bank created money uh, by increasing the base money supply. Or the banking system creating money through fractional reserves. There's really two avenues to the story. Well, let's look at the central bank, first of all. The central bank has an inflation targeting mandate. They're keep inflation low and stable, 3%. What do they do throughout the whole 2000s? They overshoot their inflation target, and they knowingly overshoot their inflation target. Everybody is well aware of this. Every single monetary bulletin that the Icelandic Central Bank writes throughout the 2000s, where they're discussing their finance, um, their operations, they talk about the fact that they're absolutely terrible at maintaining inflation, and that it's always overshooting it, right? If they're aiming for 3%, uh, only one year did we actually come under target, or, or pretty close. And why is there so much inflation? because we're expanding the base money supply at such a rapid rate, right? The very, first, uh, the very first figure, or table rather, that we looked at had base money increasing by about 33% a year for a whole decade, or almost a decade. Um, if you want to quantify it a little bit more, between 2000 and 2008, Iceland created more money than it had in its whole history prior to 2000. And Iceland's a pretty old country. I think it's the oldest democracy in the world, somebody who... Somebody who knows better can tell me. I think that's true. 1,000 years old. So we created more money in eight years than it had over the previous 1,000 years. It's a fairly drastic situation at the, hands of the, uh, at the hands of the central bank. But it's not the only one to blame. We've also got a fractional reserve banking system, which is taking all, these newly all this newly created base money and issuing credit on top of it. So we also have an expansion in the money supply this way. In Iceland... Bank-created money through fractional reserves was much more severe than in any other country in the world, or at least any other country that I've looked at. Why was this? There's actually a quirk in Icelandic banking law, which, as far as I know, doesn't exist in too many countries, if any. If you looked at America's banking system, deposit banks, 
you guys know how a, a fractional reserve bank works, or you know how a, you know how the accounting works. On your asset side, you have some reserves, right? That's cash in a vault, let's just say. And then you have mortgages, right? The loans that you've issued to consumers. And then on the liability side, you're going to have the deposits that are entrusted into your account. By law, American deposit-taking banks can only invest their assets in fixed income, uh, in fixed income assets like bonds, mortgages, or loans. In Iceland, deposit-taking banks were allowed to invest their assets in equity, stocks of other companies, or purchase companies directly. So now all of a sudden, for your typical Icelandic bank, on the liability side of the balance sheet, you've got all the deposits that people entrusted you with, and on the asset side of the balance sheet, you've got a little bit of cash sitting in reserve, a couple of mortgages that are issued, but not too many because the HFF, remember, is issuing most of the mortgages, and then a whole bunch of stocks and companies and actual companies that they've purchased with the money. Now, this is interesting. Iceland has a giant stock market boom throughout the whole 2000s. In 2006, the stock market almost returns 100%. What's happening to the assets on all of these banks' balance sheets? They're absolutely ballooning in value, correct? And as they go up in value, two things are happening. On the liability side of these balance sheets, all these deposits, banks now can issue more and more liabilities. So as their assets are rising in value through the stock market boom, banks are taking the opportunity to start issuing more and more deposits or creating money uh, to stay in balance. The second thing that they're doing is staying extremely well capitalized. Uh, I just want to give you a... Um, an idea here of how much money was actually invested in equities in the Icelandic banking system. This is showing the proportion of total income, which is coming from non-interest income for Icelandic banks. Non-interest income is typically equity appreciation. And by 2006, 80% of all bank income is coming from equity appreciation. In America, this figure would be almost 0%, right? Almost all American income for its banking sector comes from uh, interest income on mortgages and loans. So banks are fully in the stock market, and that's their primary avenue of, of growth. Now, I said that throughout this boom, as equities keep going up in value, Icelandic banks are staying extremely well capitalized. Why is that? Well, the capital of your bank is basically what's left over from your assets once you remove all the liabilities from it. So as long as your assets are increasing in value faster than your liabilities, you're okay, your, your capital ratio is going to increase. And throughout the boom, as assets were increasing in value so quickly, quicker than banks could actually increase their liabilities, these capital ra ratios stayed more or less constant. Capital ratio is important because it's one of the signals that regulators look at when they're trying to assess how stable a banking system is, right? If you look, uh, uh, if you look around the world, all of the regulators are discussing how well capitalized they are. We're looking for something maybe in the 5% figure, right? Uh, more or less. Now, in Iceland, absolutely nothing is amiss over the boom. In fact, if you compare it to other countries, like let's say the average of the euro area, Icelandic banks are really well capitalized. A little bit less than American banks. This is this black line in the middle is how well Icelandic banks are capitalized. The light gray on the bottom is the euro area. If all you're concerned with is the actual capital ratio, everything looks rosy in Iceland, right? If you dig behind the scenes, what is this capital ratio actually composed of? In America, or in many places in the Eurozone as well, it's composed primarily of fixed income investments, things which are a little higher up in the food chain of the claims um, if it's on a company which goes bankrupt or an individual which goes bankrupt. In Iceland's case, this capital ratio is contingent on equity values. So now all of a sudden, if you have a stock market collapse and share prices fall down, or if you bought a company and it goes bankrupt, this is going to take a significant hit. So it's really risky. In fact, it did take a hit. This part that you don't see that would be connecting these lines, the line doesn't just go up like that. This actually represents a capital ratio going down to zero in 2008 as the stock market in Iceland collapsed and banks lost all of their capital as they went bankrupt. And it was only really the bankruptcy of the banking system and the writing off of all of its bad assets that allowed it to return to normalcy uh, later on in the 2000s. Um, so we've got the capital, uh, the regulators who see really nothing wrong with this situation. You've got an extreme amount of credit creation, but, but nobody really cares about that because banks seem fundamentally strong. So there's, from the regulators' point of view, 
There's really nothing wrong with this. How about 2005? Banks have pretty much tapped out the domestic Icelandic market. They've got all the money that they can, they've created as much money as they can, or as much as Icelanders actually want to take on, and they need a new growth avenue. So if you're in a country of only 320,000 people and you need to expand your operations, where are you going to turn? Anywhere outside of your little country. They went to Europe. Primarily, they went to a couple of countries, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, uh, and even Poland had some Icelandic bank operations involved in it. And they did something fairly sneaky. In Iceland, interest rates were pretty high throughout the boom. They were high because inflation was really high as well, right? So if you were taking out a loan and inflation was 6.5%, uh, you were probably paying about 8% nominal interest rate on that. In the United Kingdom, throughout the boom, interest rates are pretty low, correct? In the neighborhood of, uh, well, depending on your duration, let's say uh, 2 or 3% on a 10-year loan. Icelandic banks set up subsidiaries in all of these foreign countries, and they split the difference between these interest rates. They said, uh, hello, um, Nigel, in the United Kingdom. If you give me a deposit, if you entrust your money to this bank, I'm going to give you an Icelandic interest rate. And your deposit's going to be available to you in British pounds, so you don't have to worry about it. It'll just be a normal bank account. And Nigel thinks, thinks that this is fantastic, right? Makes a lot of money, and he still has a British pound uh, bank account. How do the Icelandic banks pay this money to him? Well, they take that deposit, and they funnel it back up to Iceland. They buy Icelandic krona with it, that's the domestic currency and they invested in some high interest rate Icelandic investment. So they make a huge amount of interest up in Iceland, and then they've got this British pound deposit sitting back in the UK that they have to honor. Now, the Icelandic krona, the risk that you run in this is that the Icelandic krona depreciates someday and you lose value. Everything's fine as long as the krona keeps going up in value. And luckily, throughout the boom, the krona did keep appreciating, primarily because of this carry trade. The more money that foreigners were depositing in Icelandic banks meant the more money that was being funneled into Iceland and purchasing Icelandic krona, which meant the more appreciating pressure that you had on the krona. The problem that developed would be what happens if the krona starts losing value? What happens if it starts depreciating? Well, again, that's a problem that would have to be solved by deposit insurance companies or by the central bank acting as a lender of last resort. This is what all the banks thought would happen. And in fact, most regulators in Iceland didn't even care what was happening overseas because there was an ambiguity as to who would actually have to secure these accounts. Is an Icelandic subsidiary's bank account in the United Kingdom covered by United Kingdom banking law and its deposit insurance? Or are we going to be on the hook to cover this? As it turns out, Iceland, the government, the central bank, uh, or the deposit insurance fund couldn't be on the hook because they didn't actually have any money to honor these accounts, right? When they went bankrupt, nobody paid out. Nobody in Iceland did anyway. What was the result of all of this foreign money that was coming into the Icelandic banking system? Banks got huge. The nicest way I think you can proxy the size of a bank or the size of a banking system is to look at how big the deposit base is relative to the larger economy. Iceland. Well, let's look at America first. American banks, despite being absolutely massive, are pretty small relative to the whole size of the economy. Throughout the boom, they never got any bigger than, say, uh, 60, what are we here, 65% of the larger economy. Icelandic banks absolutely ballooned in size, right? By 2005, there's double the amount of deposits sitting in the banking system. That's domestic deposits plus foreign deposits in these subsidiaries than the greater Icelandic economy. And I should point out that these are only the on-balance sheet assets that banks have. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how high these, let's see, how high this figure would be if you included off balance sheet items like derivatives that banks have also invested in? Depending on who you want to believe, because the off balance sheet items like derivatives are really hard to uh, add up and measure, anywhere from 800 to 1100% of the Icelandic economy was held by the banking system in the form of assets. It's absolutely astronomical how large this banking system grew relative to any other country in the world. And it's primarily driven by first tapping out Icelanders for everything they're worth, and then going into foreign markets and trying to tap out foreigners for all they're worth. Okay, so we've got a situation in Iceland which is driven by huge amounts of credit creation. We've got some massive banks. Uh, and all of a sudden, 2008 rolls around, 
and Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt. Interest rates start to shoot up. Uh, people start funneling their money out of Iceland, they're a little bit scared of it, and all of these Icelandic banks go bankrupt. We've exited the boom and we've gone into the bust. So what caused the bust to actually happen? There's a couple of different theories for it, none of which I really like, or on their own, none of which I really like. The first one I already told you, Lehman Brothers went bust, and that was it. Iceland was collateral damage, uh, it didn't really do anything wrong, Iceland was okay, everything would have been fine if Lehman Brothers hadn't have gone bankrupt. If you want to believe that story, you're blaming the US government, I suppose, for not bailing out Lehman Brothers, uh, for letting it go under and taking out an innocent bystander. Uh, what's something else you can blame? How about the fact that the banks were so huge? A lot of people look at these figures and say, Iceland failed just because its banks were absolutely massive compared to the economy. It's the only country that was really like this, or one of few countries actually that was like this. So maybe that's the reason that it went bankrupt. On a related note, uh, maybe that it's the, the, the converse of this statement. Iceland went bust, or the banks all failed, because the central bank was so small relative to the banks that it couldn't save them, right? Uh, the Federal Reserve stepped in and saved a lot of banks in America. The European Central Bank stepped in and uh, at least indirectly saved a lot of banks in Europe. But in Iceland, the Central Bank of Iceland was in no position to try to do this to their banks. So maybe that's what the problem is. A lot of people have this notion that uh, Iceland failed because it was an example of free market capitalism gone wrong. Uh, to be honest, I don't know who really says this. Uh, if you know anything about Scandinavia, or actually Iceland is not a Scandinavian country, if you know anything about Nordic countries in general, they're not exactly free market paradises, correct? Taxes are very high. Iceland's economy has all sorts of labor market regulations. It may not be like Italy, but it's not exactly the free market paradise that everybody's picturing it to be, so I don't know how it could really be, uh, be this factor that's causing it to go bust. Some people say it's corruption. There's a high degree of corruption in the Icelandic economy, if you would believe it. They seem like honest northerners. Uh, they're not really all that honest. It's a small economy. It's a small country, 320,000 people. Many politicians took jobs at banks, as CEOs or as managers in banks. A lot of bank managers moved into political roles. And there was a big intertwining between the banking sector, the, site, the central bank of Iceland, and uh, your political sector. Well, those are all nice enough explanations. But I prefer one which I think is a whole lot simpler and corresponds to the facts a little bit better. Iceland's boom is a really good example of an Austrian business cycle, and the bust is really just the inevitable consequence of that business cycle. Austrian business cycles, you guys probably know about them, There's, I like to divide their, their aspects into three distinct categories. On the one hand, you've got examples of overconsumption. The Austrian business cycle, the trigger is a central bank controlled interest rate is lower or below the interest rate which would prevail to make savings and investment in equilibrium, right? So it basically can be summarized as interest rates too low. Overconsumption happens because when interest rates fall, consumers don't want to save money anymore, they just want to spend money. And in particular, they want to borrow money as it becomes cheaper to do so. Malinvestment is a term that we give to changes that happen to the capital structure or the structure of investments in the economy as interest rates fall. Any interest, any project, uh, let me rephrase this, any project's profitability is determined in part by the interest rate that prevails. When interest rates fall, present values of projects go up, correct? When central banks set interest rates too low, all present values for all projects go up in value. However, projects of long, longer maturity are more sensitive to interest rates than projects of short maturity. So that means that as interest rates fall, long duration projects become relatively more profitable than short duration projects. And this malinvestment represents investment that takes place in very long duration investment projects at the expense of shorter duration investment projects. And the final aspect of Austrian business cycles that I think is relevant is the growth in the financial sector. Your bank is the one which is responsible for issuing credit to the economy, for distributing new money which the central bank is creating to the economy. So all of a sudden it's got a whole avenue of business which is much more pronounced than it ever was before. In fact, they're the real drivers of this business cycle. They're the ones who are issuing this new money and new credit to your general public. So they must have 
uh, some role in, in growing along with the size of the general group. Well, how might we describe all three of these aspects? Overconsumption is probably the easiest one to describe. We just have to look for all the uh, ostentatious displays of wealth in the Icelandic economy from 2000 to 2008. I'll give you some examples. Uh, one Icelander wrote that he had never taken a vacation in his life, he was about 40, 45 years old, uh, never taken a vacation in his life, and during the boom, trips with his family to Dubai, to St. Tropez, became the norm. So all of a sudden, we've got Icelanders who have never even left their homes, basically, taking fancy vacations. Champagne sales went up 82% in 2006 alone, almost doubled. So instead of drinking, uh, what do Icelanders drink? Uh, water. <laughs> well, I'm sure they drink something other than water. They're switching to champagne, right? Uh, Bang & Olufsen. Does anybody know Bang & Olufsen? They make really nice high-end stereos. They're very excellent sand quality. They're also very expensive. Bang & Olufsen's biggest store by sales outside of Moscow is in Reykjavik. All of Iceland only has 320,000 people. Reykjavik is about, let's say, 275,000 of those people. Moscow is, how many Moscovites are there? 10 million. 20 million? 20 million. And the rest of the world, think of all the other wealthy cities in the world, like London or New York or Paris. And Reykjavikians are the ones who are buying the most high-end stereos. But it doesn't even end that, end there. Range Rovers. Range Rovers are pricey. Iceland sold more, Range Rover sold more uh, sport utilities in Iceland during the boom than in all of Scandinavia combined. Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. Those four countries with, uh, I don't know, combined population of 12 or 15 million maybe, couldn't even buy as many Range Rovers as 325,000 Icelanders. Giorgio Armani sent a tailor to Reykjavik exclusively to build, to uh, make bespoke uh, hand-sewn suits for businessmen. 325,000 people, that must be the size of I don't know what in Poland is 325,000 people. No, there's probably many towns that are 325,000. And I don't think Giorgio Armani is sending a tailor to those towns. I don't think Bang & Olufsen have uh, a store in those towns either. Or at least it's not the second biggest store in the world. There's all sorts of these examples of ostentatious consumption. Things that you would never imagine. And even a generation before, Icelanders who were uh, Icelanders who are elderly now, let's say 60 or 70 years old, many of them, if they came from the countryside, were born in sod huts. This country was relatively undeveloped, not even one generation ago, and now they're driving around in Range Rovers, wearing Armani suits, uh, with stereos pumping out music as they go in their private jet to St. Tropez for vacation. It's an incredible change or shift in lifestyle in a short amount of time. Malinvestment, I said, is really important, so where does it show up in the economy? The biggest way you probably, or the biggest area rather, you'd see it show up in the Icelandic economy is the investment in real estate. Real estate I more, um, real estate I more think of as an investment than, than anything else, I suppose. And it's long dated, right? Houses take a long time to construct, they take a long time to pay off, and they're extremely interest rate sensitive, right? In fact, one of the primary determinants for what kind of house somebody is going to buy is how cheap a mortgage can you get, or what rate of interest are you actually going to pay on it. So we've already looked at the real estate boom that took place. What other malinvestments could we see going on in Iceland? The biggest one is aluminum smelting. Aluminum smelting is the process that takes uh, bauxite, which is uh, ore that contains aluminum out of the ground, and processes it into aluminum blocks that then you can use uh, in other production processes. Aluminum smelting relies on three things. It, aluminum smelting profitability, I should say, relies on three things. The one is, uh, what's the price of aluminum, right? What's the price of the output that you're actually producing? The next is, what's the price of electricity? Can you get cheap electricity? And the final uh, determinant is, how cheap can we borrow money to start building aluminum smelters today so that they will give us aluminum at some point in the future? Well, luckily, Throughout the 2000s, commodities did pretty well, right? The price of aluminum skyrocketed along with most other commodities as the world uh, simultaneously entered a credit-induced boom together. So, of course, in a place like Iceland, we want to produce aluminum. The only problem is Iceland actually doesn't produce aluminum. There's no bauxite on that country. They had ships ship it up there because the one thing that Iceland has an ample supply of is cheap electricity. 
It's got all these hydroelectric dams all throughout the country, and it has thermal energy as well uh, to produce some of the cheapest electricity in the world. And producing aluminum is so energy intensive that this is really important. It didn't even have enough electricity, though, for all the plants. So in 2005, there's plans to build two huge new hydroelectric plants in the country, one on the east side and one on the west side, and these are specifically going to power aluminum smelting plants. Total price tag for these two, uh, these two hydroelectric plants was 35% of its 2005 GDP, the whole country's GDP. They were astronomical investments just to try to uh, foster this whole idea that we're going to be a country of aluminum smelters. Now, one way that we can look at some of these shifts is just by looking at your shares of GDP. GDP uh, isn't perfect, but I'm going to use it here. And we've got uh, investment expenditure, which is our top uh, sorry, uh, consumption expenditure, which is our top line. Investment expenditure is this black line. Government expenditure, which remain more or less constant. And this is our current account or our net exports down here. Government expenditure doesn't really change throughout the boom. It's increasing by a lot, but it's only remaining constant because the economy is also increasing quite quickly as well, right? Same thing with consumption, which is more or less constant during the boom. We still have overconsumption going on, it's just that GDP was increasing so quickly as well that as a, as a proportion or uh, as a share of total G GDP, it's remaining constant. Investment really skyrocketed. And investment, when it skyrocketed, again, it's in these malinvestments like aluminum smelting, this 35% of GDP that in 2005 was invested in a new hydroelectric plant that's really putting it out of control. The problem with these investments is that they are not financed through savings. They're financed through credit creation. They're financed through debt. And a huge portion of this financing is not domestically based, it's foreign based. Our current account deficit is basically how much foreign debt we're taking on in any given year. In 2006, the worst year in this regard, 17% of the Icelandic economy is borrowed from a foreign. The problem with the malinvestments is that if you're building them with credit today, at some point in the future, you're going to have to pay off all that credit, all of those bills. The problem with this is there's no savings going on in Iceland to actually pay off these investments. Icelanders have actually a negative savings rate. There's nothing there. So at some point in time in the future when the bills are due, Icelanders are not going to have any money to actually pay off these bills. They need a continual influx of credit, and especially foreign credit, in order to keep funneling into these investments to keep them going because they lack the savings themselves to pay off the debts or to finance these projects um, domestically. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about, I said the growth of, um, the, growth of the finance sector is one of, the, uh, one of the signals that an Austrian business cycle is happening. And uh, to give you a good example of that, let's just look at employment by sector in the Icelandic economy. I know the, uh, it's a little bit fuzzy here. This little black line is the fishing industry. The fishing industry was traditionally uh, the mainstay of the Icelandic economy. It was stable, a lot of people had jobs, and it supplied a lot of exports. Throughout the boom from 2000 to 2008, the Icelandic fishing industry lost 2,000 workers, which was one third. Where did those 2,000 workers go? Well, this little light gray line here is the finance industry. Fishermen turned to finance. The two top lines that you see, that's your construction industry growth. And actually, uh, Polish immigrants into Iceland were the big driver of this. I think at the, at the peak of the boom in 2007, uh, I don't remember the exact figure, but I want to say 15 to 20,000 Polish immigrants lived in Iceland, primarily working in the construction industry. Hopefully they grabbed the money and ran. <laughs> came back to Poland. There's more pretty girls in Poland than there is in Iceland. So. Uh, and what else do we have here growing? We have the real estate uh, and general business activity, which is also increasing over this period. Now, I want to focus on finance. It's a problem. We're losing fishermen and we're gaining financiers. And this reverberates throughout the whole economy. In the university system in Iceland, traditionally students were taking fisheries management classes, economics of fishery classes, things like this. And nobody wants to take these courses anymore because nobody wants to work in the fishing industry. Everybody wants the sexy finance job. So all of a sudden, even the universities start changing their course offerings, right? They offer finance courses. 
If you stop a, a typical Icelandic guy on the street of Reykjavik, you'd be you would probably get the Black Skulls option pricing formula out of this guy faster and easier than you could get the price of today's salmon catch, right? Nobody knows anything about fishing and everybody knows everything about finance. There's a big problem with this. If the boom is characterized by these people shifting from one industry to the other, the bust, and then getting out of the bust rather, you would think is reversing this. So we need to take these guys out of finance where they don't belong and we need to put them back into the industries that actually are providing exports, which are paying off some of this foreign debt, i.e. fishing. The problem with this is, just conceptualize the problem for a second. Which situation do you think is easier? Grab a fisherman off a boat, teach him the Black Skulls option pricing formula, and then throw him in the finance office and say, start trading. Or do you think it's easier to grab that guy from the finance office and throw him in a boat and tell him to go fishing? The guy who goes fishing is probably going to drown, right? It's incredibly difficult, uh, comparatively difficult, and time-consuming to teach somebody from finance how to fish rather than grabbing a fisherman and teaching him how to uh, perform a formula, right? Or collect some data for you, something along those lines. The, the last thing that I really want to show you here, and how much time do I have, actually? Got some minutes? minutes. Okay. Conflicting opinions. I'll split the difference, 12 and a half, and then we'll do some minutes. The, uh, questions. The last thing I want to talk about are the four lessons that we can take from Iceland. Four easy lessons that all of us can learn, or that other countries uh, can try to learn from, rather. The first lesson is that artificial guarantees, especially on investments, really increase risk-taking. The housing financing fund really increased uh, people's borrowing in real estate and caused a real estate boom. Deposit insurance really increased foreign lending to the Icelandic banking system and made that uh, banking system balloon in size, bigger than in any other country. The IMF muddying, muddying the waters with its comments on stability and crisis management that will come in and help you out when, uh, when you run out of money, will protect you. That increased the government's risk taking. All of these factors increase the total amount of risk taking in the economy by reducing the perception that anything bad would happen if things went wrong. The key of the Austrian business cycle is that centrally bank, uh, central bank controlled interest rates cause a, a disequilibrium to occur between savings and investments. So again, throughout the boom, Iceland's central bank does such a terrible job that interest rates fall quickly and nobody wants to save money because it's not worth their while and everybody consumes, consumes, consumes. So we've got disequilibrium on the consumption side. And then on the production side, we've got a big problem because investors are all of a sudden pursuing those really long-dated projects that aren't going to make any money for a long time, like building on a, a hydroelectric power plant. So we don't actually have any profitability out of these projects until a date so far in the future that the bills are already going to be due and we won't have any money to actually pay them off because consumers don't have any savings. Third lesson has to do with the fractional reserve banking system and its ability to foster credit creation. Not only was the Icelandic uh, fractional reserve banking system able to increase the size of the banks, it also increased the stability of them, right? As these banks were looking for investments to, uh, to expand into assets to buy, the law of diminishing returns almost says that as banks get bigger, they're going to have to buy assets of poorer and poorer quality. Well, if you've got a banking system which is uh, by on balance sheet items three and a half times the size of the economy, you're probably pretty hard pressed to get high quality assets to invest that money into. So of course the banking system was almost designed to fail by the type of low quality assets that it had to purchase. And the last lesson is what I think the most important one is. When Lehman Brothers collapsed, everybody looked at Lehman like it was the trigger that caused the whole world to come to an end. Right? Everything would have been fine, all of these countries would have been fantastic, the Eurozone would have been great, Iceland would have kept on going as long as the Americans didn't let Lehman fail. Because when Lehman failed, trust disappeared and evaporated from the system, interest rates shot up, credit was no longer available, and the whole system was uh, predicated on trust and cost of supply of credit. Lehman Brothers, the liquidity shock that was created by its bank bankruptcy, was able to cause the collapse of Iceland. But it's not the only thing that was going to cause the collapse of it. In fact, the collapse was inevitable. It was inevitable from the start. 
the investments, the malinvestments that were made over this period were of such a large extent that they were bound for failure, right? They were of such long duration, these aluminum smelting plants, these hydroelectric projects that were not going to be profitable for 15, 20 years in the future were accumulating massive amounts of debt in the present that needed to be paid off. Icelanders didn't have any money, right? The overconsumption had left the country with absolutely zero savings, actually negative savings, because the savings rate turned negative in 2006, in which to pay these projects off. So we needed a constant supply of credit. And more to the point, it wasn't just a constant supply of credit that was needed, it had to be available at low interest rates, because all of these projects were undertaken reliant on interest rates remaining low forever. Now, what do you think the likelihood is of the historically low interest rates in Iceland, real interest rates that were as low as negative 2% a year, uh, the country has never seen anything like this, what do you think the chances are that that situation is going to continue into the future? Almost zero, right? At some point in time, interest rates are going to increase. The interest rates will increase either through the increased risk perception once investors start realizing how bad the investments in Iceland actually were. Interest rates would increase in Iceland, at least real interest rates would increase uh, if inflation started tapering off and not being as high as it once was. So the whole situation was almost bound to fail. It didn't just take Lehman Brothers bankruptcy uh, to, to shock it into failure. It would have slowly ground to a halt and entered recession uh, of its own of its, own, uh, of its own making, if we had just given it enough time. I don't personally think it would have taken that much longer for it to actually do that. And I think this is the biggest misconception that people have when they look at the crisis, not just in Iceland, but around the world, in thinking that we were all innocent bystanders who were caught off guard until some terrible event happened in a faraway land that shocked us all out of our, uh, all out of our happy little fairy tale paradise. Uh, so that I don't talk too long, I was going to end it there and then field some questions for a couple minutes. I think we still have time, um, but thanks a lot for listening. There are any questions? I think we can sacrifice five minutes. Uh, we have a break. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because uh, you said at one point that who would have said that you know, the free, there was a free market in Iceland, but you only said about regulations about labor and stuff, which is true, of course, but let's say that some state is left, left to link guy sat here and said, but okay, Mr. Holden, you've got the list of guarantees, the lender has exhort the deposit insurance, but we've actually had them for decades in Iceland, mm -hmm. and what changed in 10 years ago was that we privatized the banks, right? So mm -hmm. if you are against all of these issues, if you were at the time in Iceland, wouldn't you say that, yes, if we privatize the banks, here are the list of regulations that would stop what you said, right, about the, the long to value ratio or investing in equity, right? right. Is it, it consistent? Yeah, actually, that's a good question, maybe, to, to reiterate and expand on a little bit. When people talk about the problem in Iceland being extreme capitalism, gone wrong. What they're really talking about is the privatization of the financial sector, which started happening in the mid-1990s and was completed by about 1998. Prior to that, the banks were all government-owned. The privatization, I view it, I view that specific privatization as only existing in name. The CEOs of all these banks were politically connected. It's pretty well known that all the lending that was going on was to political interests. And that was going on before they were nominally privatized. The only thing the privatization really did was allow them to put themselves in the stock market and start seeking external funding that wasn't from the government. So when I look at the banks, I think that's a bit of a, I call it a bit of a bugaboo, because it's it's the it seems really obvious. 1998, let's say banks are privatized, the privatization is complete anyway. And 1998 is when the credit creation really starts building and expanding. But I don't view that as being caused by the privatization of the banking sector because it really was no different than it was originally. So when I look at Iceland being a free market paradise, I don't like viewing, I don't like that metric as the measure for it. I think this point a little bit, and I like looking more at tax level, labor regulations, and things like that to actually measure it. But I, I think it's a good point because a lot of people do think that the privatization of the banking sector equals free market in the financial sector. But that's a little bit of a misnomer. Nothing really changed in the operations except for the name and the fact that now that you had banks listed on the stock exchange. 
uh, let's say personally, would you say that if you were a financial regulator, would you say that okay, it's a good regulation that you can borrow more than above eighty percent loan to value ratio, for example? Right? Is that if we have crony capitalism, right? if, if anything, it's better to keep it intact by by intervention, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, if you wanted to look, okay, if you want to look at the loan to value ratios. The reason why loan to value ratios got so out of hand, and they didn't really get that out of hand in a lot of other countries, like, uh, for example, even in even in Spain for consumers, which Spain had probably the most severe housing boom in, in Europe, I think, or close to it. For consumers, I don't think loan to value ratios ever got that out of hand. But something like that is more caused by the competition that had to happen for banks to stay alive, private banks to stay alive, versus the state guaranteed regulator. So maybe the question is more: If you're going to if you're going to privatize things, if you only go half the distance, so you're stuck with a private banking system that has to compete against a public lender, somebody who's guaranteed by the state. Maybe you're going to have troubles because the only way that they can possibly compete is by uh, reducing the quality of their loans, uh, partaking in questionable lending practices. But even in that case, I'd say it's not really the part of it's not the fault of the privatization of the banking sector. It's more the the fact that they had to compete against an unfair competitor in the, the state, uh, the state lender. Other questions? I just wonder if it is uh, yes, intentional from your side that you haven't used the, the word of responsibility, because actually the problem here, here is that the government has taken out of the business the responsibility of people of taking loans. So if we go back to the to the roots of the crisis. It's the government who took responsibility of individuals from the business. And then you, you, you pay no you, you pay nothing because you the loan is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So this is the root. Yeah, you always and have you don't use this word, is it intentional or yeah, yeah, it's almost well the problem with, with let's focus on deposit insurance as a as an example of it. The problem with the moral hazard is that deposit insurance creates is that you're privatizing the gains and socializing the losses. So think about your own behavior. If you could make an investment and you get 100% of the profits, and if it's and if it loses money, we're going to split the loss among every single person in this room. You would probably partake in a lot more of that investment because you're not responsible for the for the loss side of things. So I think that is a nice way to put it. And yeah, responsibility I would say is not the is not the word that commonly gets thrown around, but I think it is a nice way to summarize that people. There was a shifting of responsibility from the people to the government, but the government is really just composed up of, of everybody, right? The public sector is really, all of us, we're all on the hook for it through our taxes. So we all have a little bit of responsibility, but we get all of the gain. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I will take another one. So, uh, mm -hmm. I uh, wonder if what's the, the rough bargain way of seeing the interest rates uh, internationally, right? Since even if you had in Iceland, uh, uh, as I believe you want 100% reserve banking, right? But uh, when you've got a very high interest rates that are higher than in other countries, like like it was in the last 10 years, you, as you said, you, they were attracting depositors through higher high interest rates. So wouldn't it be self-beating if you had very high interest rates uh, in Iceland due to 100% banking, but you will still attract the money? From the other countries, which would trigger the business cycle, right? In the Austrian field. Yeah, actually, I'm not so sure that you would have high interest rates under 100% reserve banking because the high interest rates are prim primarily driven through the massive expansion of the money supply, right? When base, when the amount of base credit, when the amount of base money rather is going up by 33% a year for eight straight years, that's controlled by the central bank. When the amount of bank created credit is going up by 25% a year, that's the amount of money which is created by the banking system. That's what's driving our, our inflation rate of 6.5%. So I don't think it's exactly, and, and that inflation rate of 6.5% is what's driving Icelandic interest rates up. So I don't think it's really fair to say if we had a 100% reserve system, we would have even higher interest rates because the inflation premium would be much lower and nominal rates would also be lower. But it's a counterfactual. I suppose you never know, but this is what I would suspect, that the inflation is, in Icelandic's case, in Iceland's case, driven by high amounts of central bank and banking, fractional reserve banking created credit. 